Okay, good morning. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining this uh, Thursday morning, mentoring our time for interaction, time for questions, uh, time for discussion, um, just talk about things that would be uh, on our minds or of interest to us. Uh, thank you for connecting. Um, I've started the recording, so um, this session will be recorded for the benefit of other people. We're also having uh, people join the call now, so just give them a minute. Let's take a moment to pray, and uh, then we will get started. And um, I think it's uh, Jean or Jay, Jay Kumar who would want to host it. Uh, Jay, did you host it two weeks back? I forgot. Yeah, but I think I hosted. Uh, oh, you hosted two weeks back. Okay. Yeah, a week before last. I think. Okay, week before yeah. last. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah. Then, uh, Jane, are you okay with hosting today? Yes, Pastor. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Fine. Good. Let's just uh, pray together and uh, we will get started. Um, yeah. Um, Herbert, do you want to pray with us? Pray for all of us before we get started. Herbert. Okay, let's pray. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Father God, we want to thank you for the gift of this new day. We want to thank you for each and everybody who is already in the call. Father, we we'll give, we we'll lift out your hands onto your Lord. We dedicate unto you, we dedicate ourselves unto you, Lord, such that whatever we do, we do in your name. Uh, we also ask uh, for your tender mercies, Lord, throughout mm -hmm. this day. Uh, we also pray for those ones who are yet to connect, also to connect. Maybe those who have internet problems, you help them, Lord. We give unto you each and everything into your hands through Jesus Christ. I've prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you. Herbert. God bless you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Bless you too. So we are ready to get started. I'm handing this off to Jean, who will host the call. Everybody is welcome to participate. Uh, please go ahead. You can type your questions or unmute and ask. Uh, I have made a note of uh, two questions from last week, uh, but the people who asked the questions have not yet joined, so we'll just wait for them um, before we uh, respond to those questions. Over to you, Jean. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to this time where we can um, talk, we can discuss, bring about questions, um, any thoughts that, that's been on our mind, maybe anything that we're learning. Uh, so I leave this open. You could uh, either chat, uh, you could either put the, your question up on chat or unmute and uh, raise your questions and uh, we can address them. Yeah, so it's open uh, to all of you. Um, probably I'll just ask this question. Um, this came up while we were discussing, um, you know, in, in the Corinthians class, in the for the third year students, like we were, uh, we were going through chapter fourteen and verse twenty two. Um, Therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. And then verse twenty three. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues and there are uh, there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers will they not say that you are out of your mind and then he goes on to say you know if all prophesy then uh, you know, if an unbeliever comes then he is convicted convinced and uh, and declares that to jesus is lord uh, but i think the problem um, was with verse 22 
uh, which says that tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. And we know that, um, you know, tongues are a sign for unbelievers, like we see in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter, um, uh, Acts chapter 2, where it, uh, people speak in the known language, and then it's a sign people are drawn to, um, they, they are amazed, perplexed, and then they hear the message, and they are uh, drawn to Christ. Um, but the second part of the verse, but prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Um, and uh, and then the verses following that um, seem to be like a challenge, a contradiction. Because uh, so, if um, probably Pastor can share uh, something on those. Um... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Shri Kumar. So, um, yeah. So the, these two verses, you know, they're right after each other. Uh, but they seem like they're, they're speaking exactly the opposite things. Uh, but, but the way I've always understood it is um, that the Apostle Paul is uh, telling us of the uh, different uses of these vocal gifts, that uh, tongues, uh, like you've already shared, they can be a sign for the unbeliever, but if it is not properly exercised in a church gathering, something that was supposed to be assigned to the unbeliever can be a, a cause for mocking. You know, like, because in verse 22, he says, look, it's a sign for the unbeliever. But when you're all together and you start speaking in tongues, the same people who come in, uh, they will think uh, you're out of your mind. You know, so what is actually intended to be a gift to be used to impact the unbeliever if it is misused or not, I should say, if it's not properly exercised by the church, it can have a reverse effect. You know, it will, uh, the same unbelievers will start laughing at us, saying, what about these people are mad? You know? So uh, the, the same thing, uh, prophecy. Prophecy is primarily, like he says earlier, you know, uh, he prophesies, he edifies the church. First Corinthians 14, verse 3, he says, you know, if he's, you're edifying the church. But that same gift, which is meant to serve the church, believers edify, believers bring exhortation, edification, exhortation, comfort to the church, can be used to impact unbelievers if exercised properly. Right? So I think, um, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, the, the main point is Paul is getting across in the latter part of chapter 14 is the proper exercise of the gifts. So I think in these two verses, he's showing us both. He's showing us that if a gift is not exercised properly, what, what is supposed to be good can you know, bring a bad name. And also, a gift that is meant for the church, if exercised properly, can also affect the unbelievers and bring them in to the kingdom. So the emphasis is on the, uh, you know, exercise these gifts in a, you know, in a, in a proper way and it will have impact to the church as well as to the unbelievers. Yeah, Pastor, I think, um, yeah, yeah, that's the thing. <clears throat> so um, the, I think that, that um, just that statement, no, but prophesying is not for unbelievers. I think that was the one which, um, which is a little challenging. Um, mm. um, you know, but uh, yeah, the, the other thing is, yes, of course, mm. that um, the proper usage of gifts and how it can benefit uh, both the unbeliever and the believer. Yeah, mm. yeah I think mm. a good example will be in John 4, you know, the prophetic, where Jesus was sitting at the woman at the well, and he, you know, there was a word of knowledge, and he called out, you know, go and call your husband. She says, I have no husband. And he, so there's a beautiful ex ex uh, example where, uh, the prophetic is used to impact somebody you know who doesn't know much about God. And, yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Back to you, Jean. Thanks. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Pastor Jayakumar. Thank you, Pastor, for uh, addressing that. Yes, the um, it's open for any other questions. Um, so if you could put up your questions or just unmute. We could uh, answer that, yeah. 
even if it is a question that was probably raised in class, uh, it would be nice if we could bring that up here so that all of us could learn too. So there was a question that was raised in class and we required any more clarity. It can be raised here as well. Uh, hello, Pastor Jean. Hello, Herbert. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. Um, I have uh, have some colleagues of mine who are in e-learning, and uh, you know you cannot easily access like the current uh, information or like assignments before completing the prerequisites and uh, and and so on. So um, could there be some assignments which are yet to be due uh, within this time as maybe they have not yet got some like enough for megabytes to download all other information and they get up to date. Uh, they are worried that they might, they might be caught up with, with, the, uh, with the deadline. Thank you. Uh, I'm just trying to see if I understood it. Yes, Pastor. Yeah, yeah. So Herbert, um, yeah. What we will do is uh, we will. Uh, yeah, okay. So so the reason we have um, like um, the prerequisite is uh, we want to make st make sure that all those on the e-learning that they actually watch all the lectures because you know they're not attending class. That's why we make it uh, a requirement to watch all the classes in. Uh, in sequence um, uh, and similarly with the assignments. Uh, but what we can do is uh, I will request all the staff that uh, we don't have a end, a due date on the assignments, right? So we'll keep the due date open till the end of the semester so that, uh, you know, at any point in time, they can finish it as long as it's before the last date of the semester. So we will, uh, we will request uh, staff to do that so uh, due dates can be left open you know so as far as because basically on the e-learning a student can start any time and as long as they finish before the end date they are fine so we will request that and that will be helpful um is that okay yeah thank you so much it is very clear and and it is very good i i hope nobody now will have an excuse of not uh, because some people, some don't have computers, some they share telephone, maybe like that. So it, it is a challenge. But then, if there is, as long as you complete them before the end of the semester, semester it is okay. That is very okay, Pastor. Okay. Yeah, we will do that. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Okay. Mm. Sorry, uh, I, yeah, I think uh, there's, there's just probably one more issue. I think at the end of each probably unit, there are, I think some of faculty have put in things called as knowledge checks that seems to uh, be completed. And although they're not graded, but it needs to be completed before they enter into the next uh, unit. So I think that seems that is more, uh, you need a prerequisite to have completed it before you can go on. But the assessments or the assignments are uh, can be put in up to to later so would that be okay Oscar? yeah so the the knowledge checks don't have an end date so so they have to basically they have to do it meaning yeah but there's no end date so as long as they go through it before the end of semester it's good yeah yes thank you pastor yeah, thank you yeah thank you Herbert. Yes, questions. Uh, I'm sure it's not a dry day. We, we, I'm sure we have a lot of things to ask. So uh, type in or jump in.
Yes, Divya, thank you for raising your hand. Yes, Divya, you could unmute and uh, share your question, please. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so my question is from Romans chapter 9, um, from 6 to 12, uh, where it talks about um, uh, Isaac's children, Esau and Jacob, uh, uh, especially with, I, I'll just read that, 6 to 12. Uh, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac, your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time, I will come and Sarah will, uh, shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by her father Isaac, um, and in brackets it's written, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Uh, uh, so I was a bit confused with... Uh, uh, what what was written in the brackets uh, saying, right, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, um, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. And then it goes on to say that Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Um, so it is not based on anything they have done, but why uh, is it said that way? Okay, um, Divya, thank you for bringing this up. Uh, we just uh, we just covered this yesterday in a study on the Book of Romans, so uh, Pastor Roshan will be. Uh, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> anyway, so uh, but okay, uh, let, uh, let me just quickly say this. One is if you want to like understand the full chapter of Romans, Romans nine. Uh, we did we did it yes just yesterday. So if you go to our uh, YouTube, uh, what is it called? APC Bible. I think it's called APC Bible College. Yeah, if you go to our YouTube channel, uh, I think this is the correct one. I didn't hope I didn't make a mistake. Uh, and if you go to the third year, uh, third year track, and um, you just pick up the video on from the course on Romans, yesterday's lecture, uh, we covered um, all of chapter nine in that. So we'll, you know, it's ex we will explain it um, through. But let me just uh, quickly summarize uh, what what. So basically, um, here in Romans Romans nine, ten, and eleven, uh, the apostle Paul is addressing the question on uh, what is God doing with the Jewish people, while the emphasis now is on the church. Right. So that's like the overarching question he's addressing in these three chapters. So till Rome, end of Romans 8, he's been talking to believers, we are in Christ and so on. In Romans 9, 10, 11, he's shifting focus to addressing this question. So Romans 9, 1 to 5, the Apostle Paul shares his heart uh, uh, you know, for the Jewish people, he says, you know, of course, he's an he's an apostle to the Gentiles. He's been he's preaching the gospel, uh, but that doesn't mean he has lost affection for his own Jewish people. And so he um, he he talks about that in the first five verses, and then he says, you know, these Jew, the Jewish people, or the nation of Israel, they are the ones who have received all the covenants, the promises, and all of that from God. So what is God doing now? So that's what verse six starts off with, you know, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. That means it's not that God's promises to Israel has gone void, right? Because God's word is not. So that means God's promise to Israel and the Jewish people is still in effect. And then he begins to, uh, you know, state two important things. The first thing is this, he says, but the promise that was given, this was verses seven through nine, uh, seven through nine, the promise that God gave to he, the people of Israel, he said that 
uh, he, he said in, uh, you know, it, it is referring to the children of promise. So he's not just referring to the natural born children of Abraham, but he was actually referring to the spiritual children, which is basically all of us who believe in Jesus Christ. That's how he ends Romans 9. Then verse 10, he says, and not only this. So the second thing. So that means God is, God's word to Israel is still in effect because what he promised them is not just to the natural born children of Abraham, but also to those who are spiritual descendants. That's why whatever God is doing now through the church is still actually in effect, fulfilling what his word to Israel. And not only that, so that means here's another thing I want you to know is what Paul is saying. And then he starts talking about the overall purpose of God. He says, and I'm just summarizing this passage and we'll get into verse 11 in detail, but he says, the overall purpose of God is still in effect. And throughout chapter nine, the rest of chapter nine, he is quoting, he's, he's referencing different figures from the Old Testament to show how the purpose of God is fulfilled. And somehow the choosing of man kind of comes into that, right? So, uh, and we were discussing this in the lecture yesterday, that we need to interpret scripture in the light of the rest of scripture. That means uh, we cannot, so, in, in the rest of scripture, we see the sovereign, the, the, the free will of man. So there is the sovereignty of God, the sovereign purpose of God, which is his, you know, that's verse 11, the purpose of God and according to whom he selects the people that he wants to work through and so on. So there's a sovereign purpose of God. And yet there's a free will choice of man coming in. Uh, and these two meet together in a, in, a, in a wonderful and sometimes even mysterious way, right? So man is a free will agent, free moral agent, and yet God is a sovereign God, and yet these two come together. So he's saying, you look at Jacob and Esau, God's sovereign purpose was proclaimed even before they were born. Even before they were born, God said, the younger will serve the older. So uh, no, no, sorry, the older will serve the younger. That is Esau will serve Jacob. It was prophesied or spoken even before they were born, before they, they knew even, you know, they were new good and evil. They made a choice, anything. God already said that. He also said, I love Jacob. I hate Esau. And these words were spoken even before they were born. Uh, so does that mean so, so God is declaring his purpose. Does that mean these, these people didn't have a choice, you know, that they were just uh, robots uh, and, you know, that things had to happen just because God spoke that way? No, we understand that man always have a, has a choice. So God in, in, in speaking ahead of time was not predetermining their choices, but declaring their choices ahead of time and declaring his purpose ahead of time. His purpose is always, like in this case, he's working through the nation of Israel for his purposes. And he's chosen to work through these two people, Jacob and Esau. But each one made their own choice. So why did God love Jacob and hate Esau? Hebrews 12, um, 25, 26, 27 talks, talks about it. it. It tells us there that, you know, and it's, it refers to, uh, Esau as a fornicator, and so on. Uh, Hebrews 12, let me get the right word, sorry. Uh, Hebrews 12, uh, 16 and 17, yeah? Uh, and the reason is because Esau was a man who sold his birthright for the sake of one meal. He was a man who yielded to the flesh. Jacob, in spite of his flaws, chose to pursue God, right? Uh, he chose to pursue God. He was not a perfect man, but he chose to pursue God. So God says, I love that and I hate that. So he's not necessarily hating the individual. Of course, they made their choice and they experienced what the outcome of their choice. But God is saying, I love the man who pursues the things of God in spite of his own weaknesses. So God is declaring his purpose even before things happen. He's not predetermining individual's choice. Uh, and the purpose of God according to his selection is at work and people by their own choice, come in, align themselves to what he wants. 
right? And then there's a lot more that he talks about in the rest of chapter nine. He talks about Pharaoh, you know, it says God hardened his heart. What does that mean? Uh, it talks about, he gives the example of the potter and the clay. Uh, and uh, you know, and we, we bring out the fact that there's a difference between the clay and us. The clay has no choice, but we have a choice and so on. So it, it'll be useful if you listen to that lecture. Uh, Roshan's put that up on the, uh, on the, on the thing. So that explains all of chapter nine. I've tried to, you know, very quickly uh, answer your question, Divya, but uh, this is a very challenging chapter. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, so uh, here, uh, unless uh, we, we bring that free will into account, um, we may fail in the right interpretation, right? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. In fact, uh, there's a separate school of thought. Uh, we call it Calvinistic theology, where Calvinism that uh, excludes the free will of man, and therefore they just focus on the sovereignty of God and the pre pre uh, predestination of God, and so then that kind of leaves us in a uh, difficult position. But it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, I guess I'm encountering so many of those ideas. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vivia, for the question. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, yes. Um, uh, it's open out again for questions. Yes, John. Yes, John. Thank you for yeah. raising a question. Yes. Um, hi, Pastor. So uh, in Hebrews chapter Go 5, ahead, verse yes. 7, in the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. Um, so we see Jesus uh, prays with loud crying and tears. Um, so uh, we do understand the need of prayer and supplication, uh, but practically, when we're speaking, um, it, it, is loud crying st still part of our prayers to God? Uh, sorry, John, I missed the reference. Could you? Could you um, Hebrews the chapter reference? five, verse seven. Okay, so so your question was: Is loud groans and cries still part of? Our prayer? Yes. Does it okay. need to be? Uh, yeah. Okay, that's a very interesting question. Um, can I open this out to anyone to answer that? His question was, are groans, cries, part should be part of our prayer uh, as we as we intercede? Uh, if I may just quickly uh, add my sure. thoughts. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think the classic uh, verse that we can look at is uh, Romans 8, 26, 27. Uh, it says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, there are times in our lives and uh, seasons that, I mean, we don't really know what to pray for. I mean, to express it. Uh, sorry, Roshan. We're not able to hear you. I think he's... Roshan? Okay, I, I think he's, uh, he's, he's lost connectivity. So uh, he was bringing about the verse where the spirit groans uh, for us, prays. So I, 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 I'll, I'll take that on and maybe when he comes, I think he can also clarify that uh, that reference of, of the spirit crying for us on, be a intercede, 
interceding on behalf of us is something that we see as an example and that's uh, something that uh, um, you know it, it is an expression of the heart of uh, groaning crying praying out um, in, in loud in the spirit uh, even in the psalms i'm sorry i don't know the reference to that but it talks of how uh, our tears are um, are in a bottle you know that god sees the pain and the struggle that we uh, we go through as we intercede or as we make our supplication yeah so i uh, is there anybody else who'd like to add to that and roshan if you're back uh, would you kindly continue to address that uh, no thank you sorry uh, um, the i mean the connection brought at the same time i finished so my <laughs> point i think uh, yeah but thank you, thank you. Uh, yes john i hope that answers your question ah uh, yes kind of uh, okay would you like to expand on that or have a follow up on it uh yeah so um so so the conclusion should be uh it not necessary that every time we pray we need to have loud crying but it depends on even the circumstances and god considers our cries and tears uh, yes right, and that there's been an been an example that the spirit has also shown which i mean if you were asking is it okay or is it acceptable uh yes it is the expression of uh, you know a, a prayerful expression that you are uh, yeah, a, a a method of an expression to yes yes thank you yeah. and just another if i may uh, another uh, i was reminded of this other character in the bible i think anna uh, in samuel the book of samuel it says uh, i mean that she she was crying out with, with so much pain and i uh, you know that some of the priests thought that she was drunk Uh, but actually she was just expressing her pain in in wordless uh, you know groans and in crying so yeah that's yeah it can look at the book of samuel so. all right thank you thank you pastor roshan all right we have yeah, yes nancy please yes nancy please i ahead. just thought i'd add add uh, one more point to what um, has is being discussed so uh, john uh, uh, yeah like um when we pray uh, i don't think always you know to be loud and to present our prayers in such an intense way is required uh, but yes as uh, pastor roshan said sometimes uh, depending on the circumstances and depending on you know uh, the the state of our hearts uh, this is very much applicable like we saw in the case of hana i was just reminded of that uh, short prayer which jesus made in um um uh, just look up the reference yeah john 11 verse 43 where he uh, just uh, sort of calls out with a loud voice lazarus come forth right so uh, but god heard that prayer so uh, i'm just thinking like it's not always required i think it's more about our faith and the fact that we are coming to god we are approaching god you know and uh, with the right attitude that is important in prayer is sometimes the expression uh, uh, can be intense but yes that is sometimes yeah i just wanted to add that yeah. thank you jean thank you john thank you pastor nancy thank you pastor thank you everyone thank you john all right there's a there's another question um up on the chat and i'll just read that uh, what is what are the seven churches and the revelation john is talking about some somebody teach me this is this, is this a seven kind of century in seven centuries are uh, the body of christ seventh century uh heal of the body which one is saying in genesis 315 um brother abhish uh, would would you kindly um, you know just clarify for me uh, are you looking at uh, what are the seven churches in the revelation of john in 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 revelation is that what you are asking for yes yes okay okay um the pastor may i ask you to address this question yeah um yeah thank you abhish thanks jean uh 
So this, these seven churches that John was uh, John was writing to were a literal seven uh, seven churches in seven cities that were there at that time, right? Uh, and all of these were actually very close to each other. So it, in today's map, today's world map, if you imagine Turkey, uh, the country of Turkey, on the west coast of Turkey, on the uh, on the west coast, there's a sea port, a port town called uh, Ephesus, or Ephesus was there. It was a seaport town, so it was on the it's a coastal town on the east on the west coast of Turkey, and all the other six churches were very close to where Ephesus was. So these were literal churches, are very close to each other, all of them in that region. And John was on the island of Patmos, which is just little away from the coast on a separate island. He was there. So Jesus was giving a message to these seven churches. So the correct way to understand Revelation 2 and 3, chapters 2 and 3 is, this is a literal message from Jesus to each of these seven churches, which were existing at that time. To take that and then to say that this represents seven, seven church ages, which many preachers do, is not correct. Uh, that is uh, using that in a very wrong way. But many preachers do that. They say that, okay, these seven churches represent seven ages. That is not given. Uh, that is not true. Because even when Jesus is speaking to John, he says, John, I'm going to speak to you of things that are and things yet to come. So the things yet to come start off from chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, Revelations, chap Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3 are things that are. So Jesus tells John, John, write the things which you have seen. That is Revelation chapter 1. Things that are, that's Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And things that are yet to come, Revelations 4 onwards. So that's how we must understand it. Uh, and so it is wrong to interpret as seven ages. Now, can we learn from those seven churches? Definitely, right? We can read it. And we can say, okay, these, these are the mistakes they made. Uh, we must not make the same mistakes. And uh, these are the good points they had. We should imitate the good points. So definitely we can learn from all the seven churches. But to use that and say they represent seven ages or seven parts of the body of Christ, uh, that is wrong. It's okay. Obviously. Obviously. Right. Thank you for the question, Brother Ravish, and thank you, Pastor. Right. Um, anybody else would like to bring up a question? Okay, there's a question by Herbert. Um, I read an article where 40 was repetitively used in the Bible, like 40 days of rain during Noah's time, 40 days of Jesus in the wilderness, 40 days of the apostles receiving the Holy Spirit uh, many times. People normally say that the days of a thief are only 40. Could there be a secret in 40? OK. Um, would somebody like to address this? Uh, Pastor uh, Jay Kumar or Pastor Nancy about the 40, uh, the representation of 40 being a number in scripture. Or Pastor Rashid. Uh, okay, Herbert. So, Herbert, uh, the truth is that. In the Bible, God uses certain numbers to signify certain things in the Bible. But uh, so, so we need to be aware of it, but we must not create a science like numerology out of that. So that's a balance we need to maintain and be careful not to get into. So, you know, there is there, there are all, all these, you know, what I don't call them as dark sciences like numerology and palmistry and astrology and all of the, um, as, uh, those kinds of things. So while God does speak uh, in scripture, while there are certain numbers that are used in a certain way by God, 
doesn't mean that uh, we should, you know, go into numerology. So, uh, you know, we need to keep that foremost in our mind. So the answer to your question is yes. There are certain numbers in the Bible that indicate certain things, right? So number seven is used throughout in the, in the Bible as a, as a symbol, or a symbol or as a number for perfection, you know, uh, so you find that throughout the Bible. So 12 is used for government. Uh, that means leadership, administration, government. So 12 tribes, 12 apostles, you know, it, it, it's rep so number 12 is used that way. Uh, and so similarly, we see the 40 being used, you know, in a, in a very significant way to talk about the season of you know, you could use it as a season. Of, I mean, I'm just signify, using it that it signifies a season of transition. Forty is used, you know, as as that. You know, it took uh, 40, 40 years for Moses in the wilderness to go from, you know, uh, the runaway uh, person to being the leader. Forty years from Egypt to Canaan. Forty days, like you said, you know since uh, uh, it was actually Pentecost, which is 50 days, but uh, since uh, uh, Luke says, you know, he showed himself alive, showed himself alive for 40 days. So um, the transition. So this 40 is used that way in scripture, right? Now that does not mean uh, you read that into Every time you see 40 or 40 chapters in the, this Bible or, you know, I have, I've turned 40, so it's time to transition or, you know, don't re read that into every num every time you see 40. You only do it when, uh, when, when God is saying, look, this 40 means this, right? When the Holy Spirit is really highlighting it to you. Otherwise, don't read into every 40 that you see as a season or a time for transition. That's what I would uh, say. Is that okay? Yes, thank you, Pastor. Okay. Uh, I I just uh, I I just want to actually, Pastor. I wanted I had a, a yes. follow up question. So a lot of people, you know, when especially during fasting periods, um, there are these numbers that are used of seven, twenty one, forty, uh, and uh, to and and a lot of them when when you actually ask them, they say forty days of fasting to emulate what Jesus did. Um, so there have been questions that have come asking, should there be specific days of fasting? Um, and I, I think the obvious answer is, uh, even in fasting, it is the heart change, not the period of time. So would that be correct? Yes, yes, yeah. So, you know, we don't, uh, we don't like think these numbers are magical that, okay, if somebody fast for it, because somebody could fast 40 days and nothing happens, but if somebody could fast four days and, something big happens, you know. So uh, the, an the correct answer is yes, it's the heart before God. Uh, the days themselves are not magical, yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, thank you, Herbert, for, uh, for that question. Yeah, John's asked a question. In Revelation 7, 5 to 9, we don't see the tribe of Dan mentioned among the uh, 144,000. Could there be any reason? Also, the tribe of Joseph, could it mean Ephraim? All right. Um, uh, I think uh, Pastor Paul, would you yeah, like to okay. take that question? Oh, Pastor, Pastor, yes. Pastor Paul or Pastor oh, You want to go ahead? Yeah, you can go ahead. Uh, but if you. Oh, uh, I'm not really sure of this, so I think oh, Pastor Ashish should be. Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. Thank yes, you. yes, Pastor Ashish, over to you. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, John. So, uh, yeah, so we don't know. Uh, so the answer to your second part of your question is yes. Uh, so most people, uh, you know, they know that okay, the tribe of Ephraim is left out, but Joseph is there, so uh, he so that replaces Ephraim. Now, we don't know why the tribe of Dan was left out, uh, but, you know, some scholars think, and I'm just saying this is just, you know, what scholars think is because of their disobedience or the fact that they didn't, uh, you know, uh, were, were not completely aligned to God's ways. So, so maybe that's why they were left out. Right? It, it's not stated there why in Revelation 7. So people think that it's because of that. 
we are not sure, but that's what scholars will say. Maybe, maybe the, the, this tribe didn't, you know, didn't really walk in obedience to God, or uh, so on. Yeah. Okay, Master. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, John. Um, I think Kiran's uh, put up a question. Mark 1, 13 to 14. John knew all before John Baptist and did all works. Okay, let me just read that. I'll just pick that up, please. Okay, it's Mark 1, 13 to 14. I'll just read that. And he was and he was there in the wilderness 40 days tempted by Satan and was with, with the wild beasts and the angels ministered to him. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. John knew all before John the Baptist and did all works. Um, I don't know if you've made the right reference to the scripture, uh, Kiran. Uh, and would you like to ask your question? Kiran, if you could unmute or just probably type in. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, the verse is saying the, the here is little bit prophesied. It happened, but uh, is that John who did who used to uh, do baptism to people before Christ coming? Uh, uh, what is your reference, uh, Kiran? Your reference is not Mark, I suppose. Is your reference John one thirteen to fourteen? Yes, ma'am. Sorry, the the reference is Luke one. Luke. Luke chapter okay. 1, 13 to 14. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Ma okay. All right. Luke 1, Luke 1, 13 to 14. Uh, I don't think that's the reference either. This talks about uh, the angel um, appearing to Zacharias and Elizabeth. Uh, I. I don't think that's your thing, but but I think your question was, uh, did John know what were the, okay, you need to kindly repeat that. What was the question? Or if you can give us the reference, that will help us have a, um, a background of what your question would be, Kiran. Yeah, ma'am, look, chapter 1, verse 13 to 14 here. That's not the verse uh, that you, I think you're referring to. Because here, the verse is where uh, the angel appears to Zacharias and Elizabeth. It says, the angel said to him, do not yes, be afraid. Yes, yes ma'am, yes, this one. OK, so what's the question, Kiran? And here the little question is like that. Uh, angels appear to Zechariah and don't be afraid. And Elizabeth have son. Uh, you you keep the name John. Okay. All right. Uh, so so did John knew that he would become John the Baptist and did would do all the yes, works? Yes, Was that yes, your question? Yes, yes, oh, yes. Okay. All right. So the question is, did John know that he would become John the Baptist before he became John the Baptist and that he would do these works? I think that that's her question. Um, OK, I'd like to open this up for thoughts from from the other pastors. So what what I what I uh, see is that there was a call to John's life, and uh, as the angel revealed to Zacharias and Elizabeth that um, uh, you know that they would uh, that he would uh, that they would bear a child, uh, they definitely knew that there was a call from God for his life, and uh, he walked 
uh, in that call. And even scripture, you see prophetically, it's been spoken about someone who comes to prepare the way for the Lord. Um, and that was a referring to John the Baptist. So there was a call on his life. He walked in it. And, uh, you know, he walked in that in the purposes. Um, but maybe I'm not too clear if he did know that he was being spoken about by the prophets, that he would be the voice calling out in the desert. Uh, if someone could probably clarify that. Yeah, um, just so quickly, uh, I respond to that. I, this is my understanding, uh, both for John the Baptist and even for the Lord Jesus Christ. You see that, uh, yeah, of course, there were all the scriptures spoken of Jesus himself or John thing. But uh, I believe that they, over time and through their relationship with God, came to recognize the call of God. It, it wasn't like, you know, when baby Jesus was born, uh, he immediately knew the purpose of God. Because the Bible says, and, and we can look at scriptures, Look, Luke says he grew in stature and favor and wisdom. Uh, Isaiah 50 verse 4 says, you know, morning by morning he was taught by the Father. So, why would he have to be taught by the father if he knew everything at the time of his birth? Why would he have need have to grow in wisdom and in favor if he knew everything at his birth, right? So you see that there was a progressive growth because he grew as a man. He left aside his omniscience and he grew as a man. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. And if it applies for Jesus, then it definitely would apply for John so that he too would, you know, over time come into recognition of God's plan and purpose and then you know, recognized that his calling was defined, was expressed in certain scriptures. You know, why would John say, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness? How did he know to quote that scripture? He saw his calling in the Old Testament scripture, and that would have happened only through his relationship with God. So uh, it was a recognition of God's call over time, not at the moment of birth. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Ashish. Um, we've uh, come to the end of our session today. We are at uh, 8.53. Um, may I quickly request somebody to please pray and close uh, the session? Uh, anyone, any one of the students. Uh, Jordan, may I request that you close the word of prayer? Or Jordan or Zilatoli, and anybody, if you could quickly unmute and close. Let me pray. <clears throat> Father God, thank you so much for this uh, session. Thank you, Lord, for our pastors, for clarifying our thoughts, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Whatever we have learned, Lord, help us to remember Holy Spirit and help us to be a good witness, Lord. And as we disperse from this session, I pray that Holy Spirit continue to guide us, lead us throughout the day. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Zilatoli. Thank you, Amen. everyone, for joining in. Thank you. Uh, meet you all at class. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, sir. Thank you, Lou.